So I want to welcome you to this um, neuro um, neurostimulation case study. As Christina already said, I'm Dr. Yobes. I'm a Dartmouth Hitchcock and direct the epilepsy center there. And I'm glad that you all made it this afternoon. I don't know who you all are, but I hope a lot of you are fellows that are gonna learn something about neurostimulation today. I, these are just my disclosures. I have some support from Neuropace for research. I just wanna mention that. And this is a case study. I um, want to um, introduce you to a patient of mine. Her name is Cindy, and she's a 55-year-old woman, and she was brought in by her brother, actually. She has seizures with altered awareness, and her seizures consist of that she puts the hands to her ears, um, and it's not entirely clear how often they are happening, but they are happening at least once a week as she li lives alone. She also has a history of hearing voices. She lives alone, as I said, but she calls her brother more than once daily, which kind of drives him crazy. And um, otherwise, she's very unsteady on her feet with significant ataxia. And this is the first time I saw her, and this is the medication combination she was on. She is on phenytoin, gabapentin, carbamazepin, chlorazepat, clodiazepoxide, haloperidol, benstropin. If you don't know some of those, some of those are really old medications. And they were basically asking whether there is any option for epilepsy surgery. So we were considering this, whether she's a candidate for epilepsy surgery, and she had that MRI. Um, if you see it, maybe somebody wants to comment what this MRI shows on the chat. Anybody? Oh. No? Right, tempor right hippocampal sclerosis, yeah, great. Um, so this shows right MTS, you may not see it very well, but there is some hyperintensity on, um, in the hippocampus. So we also did some neuropsychological um, testing where she had overall global impairment in several domains, working memory, receptive language, cognitive flexibility, and no clear lateralization. And then we did a water test. Um, and actually what this showed, that she has severely impaired memory using her left side and actually mildly impaired memory using her right side. So her left, uh, her right hippocampus seems to be somewhat functional and she's left language dominant. So now we come to the question, what would you do next? And we're actually doing a poll and I hope you're all seeing the poll. Um, what would you do? Would you change her anti-seizure medications? Would you put in a VNS? Would you do an intracranial EEG study? Would you do a right-sided temporal lobectomy? Or would you do um, a right-sided laser surgery, lit? Or would you do a right-sided temporal lobectomy and an RNS on the left? Would you do a DBS in the anterior nucleus of the salamis or an RNS in the right hippocampus? And I hope you see the poll. Now they are seeing it. And Take your time. Often in medicine, there is not one right answer. There is often many answers. Okay. I'll give it one more minute to make your decision. Okay. So end polling, 
and share results. So I hope you're seeing the results. So there seems to be a preponderance for doing a um, intracranial EEG study. Um, however, there are also other options. It's just doing an RNS or do laser surgery on the right or temporal lobectomy. Um, these are all good options. Um, so what we did actually, we did an intracranial EEG study. We hadn't really given up on surgery yet. Um, and this was uh, in a time where we did this with steps electrodes. Now we probably would use more SEG electrodes, but we studied both hippocampi and the lateral temporal regions. Um, and as you see here, this is one of her seizures. This is the left hippocampus. This is the right hippocampus. And you see um, that, you know, it clearly starts somewhere here that has some repetitive spiking and then it builds up further and further. And you have this nice discharge on the right um, that basically stays on the right side. She did not have any um, left-sided seizures. So now the question, came up, what do we do next? So we thought maybe our water test is wrong. And we repeated the water test that actually showed the same results as the first water test. So now you have done the intracranial study. Um, and these are the options. Um, what would you do now? Um, same options, you know, but you know a little bit more. So as we are about 50 people on this, we're gonna wait a little bit till we have a higher number of people. And thank you for joining, by the way. Okay, now 33 people have voted. Um, these are the results. Um, so there seems to be now not as much agreement what we're gonna do. So um, most of the people suggested an RNS in the right hippocampus um, or a right temporal lobectomy, which comes second. Um, or as, if you kind of add up the right side of temporal lobectomy with lit, it's probably beating <laughs> the RNS on the right. Okay, so I'm going to tell you later what happened, of course. Um, hold on, let me close this. The, um, so, of course, if we want to make a decision and you're in this clinical dilemma, um, what you of course want to make a decision based on the best evidence and what is known about this. And uh, of course, um, as you all know, the most effective therapy for drug resistant epilepsy is still epilepsy surgery. And you're probably well familiar with the Sam Beep study, which is one of the two randomized controlled studies um, that showed that 58% are seizure free. The other randomized controlled study was the ERSET study by Engel, where um, about 73% were seizure free, but it had only very few patients in it. And they did surgery within two years of epilepsy onset. If we take the retrospective studies, the outcomes can be even better. However, if you do long-term outcomes, it goes down to about 62%. We do less 
valve in frontal lobe epilepsy surgery, where the seizure free rate may be below 50%. However, if you take all epilepsy surgery that ever is performed, the magic number comes down to 64%. And of course, this is very different from best medical treatment that um, the max seizure freedom and freedom you can reach is 8%. So what did we do? We actually, we decided, so the big question was, should we do that right-sided surgery or should we not do this right-sided surgery? And this is, of course, a question that can be discussed. We decided against it for the risk of a significant memory loss, and we thought we should pursue a stimulation approach. And that comes actually to the question, when is stimulation for epilepsy indicated? I talked to you about epilepsy surgery, but when is really stimulation indicated? And of course, also for drug-resistant epilepsy, if the patient is not a surgical candidate, if focal, you must have focal epilepsy for some stimulations, but ever other epilepsies may also be considered. And also in patients with bilateral seizure onset zones like bitemporal lobe epilepsy. Um, and um, if you consider stimulation, you should also like think about what is the concept of electrical stimulation and before we even talk about electrical stimulation i think it's really valuable to think about basic physics that every stimulus has an amplitude it has a pulse width it has a frequency within a stimulus how often this is delivered and you can do stimulation either intermittent or continuous, which is also something you may consider, or you can do it responsively to a certain uh, uh, to a certain event. And if you just go through what people have tried to stimulate for epilepsy, there are lots of things that have been tried since the 70s, where actually cerebellar stimulation was very on vogue, but then abandoned. Also, there were stimulation attempts, and this is all in humans in the substantia nigra. So, what has been somewhat the winner is the thalamus. Um, also, people try to uh, stimulate the caudate, as well as, of course, the cortex, um, the subthalamic nucleus, as well as the hippocampus. Um, and as I told you, the thalamus seems to have made it the furthest as well as there are some attempts of hippocampal stimulation, which are not FDA approved. And then of course the cortex is also stimulated with devices like the RNS. So in the three devices that are currently approved for neurostimulation are the DBS uh, the, uh, from Medtronic, then the RNS uh, from Neuropace, and then of course neurostimulation therapy, we should also always think about the VNS with a vagal nerve stimulator. And now, if you were to decide in our patient against um, surgery, um, and you, you would put in a device, which device would you put in? Okay, we'll go up over 30 again, okay. So we are up to 39 people. I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. So there seems to be um, clear, clear agreement that um, an RNS may be a good option, okay. Um, let me go over here. So, but if we think about those things again, we also want to think about what is the evidence for all these devices and what can we make an informed choice, which one of these devices we should put in. Um, 
and I'm just going to go through the three devices and give you some evidence and what it shows. And with everyone, there is a question um, about the device. So this is the question, which statement about um, the RNS is true. Hold on. I'm trying to make this work here. Yeah, continue. Um, oh, sorry, this was the wrong question. Question number four. Okay. So, which statement about the DBS is uh, true? Um, is uh, the, and there is actually only one. Um, stimulation of the anterior nucleus of the salamus is more effective than stimulation of the central medium nucleus. Stimulation of the anterior nucleus is indicated in focal epilepsy. Stimulation of the central medium nucleus is indicated for generalized epilepsies. Um, tissue frequency reduction after five years of DBS ranges around 40%. Or patients have a 20% seizure reduction after implantation, regardless whether the stimulator is off or on. So we're gonna wait a little more, what people think. Okay, we are over 40 and I'm gonna share the results. The winner seems to be the 40% seizure frequency reduction after five years. Um, I'm gonna tell you for this question, there's one right answer and I'm gonna tell it, tell it later after we have gone through the evidence. Um, so, some um, some facts about TBS. TBS um, of the salamis is the one application that is approved. It's a Medtronic device, as you see here. And the concept is really why does it make sense to stimulate the thalamus is this concept of remote stimulation basically affecting the limbic system that you see here with which includes the fornix, the single of the hippocampus, um, that this is basically modulated by this stimulation. And the targets that have been used are the anterior nucleus and the central medium nucleus. It has an epilepsy test been tested only for intermittent stimulation, but it can also be set as continuous stimulation. And these are the parameters. So it's usually between one and 10 volts. It has a pulse width, as you see. This is the frequency. And every device has a battery life um, that actually continuously goes up. However, the stimulation, if it's intermittent stimulation, is delivered for about four hours a day. And that is the study that actually led to the approval for this. This is a randomized controlled trial in 108 patients. And it's called the Santa, uh, the Santi trial. It's stimulation of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus for epilepsy. Um, and here you see the results. So the green is the active control and the red is the control. Here the, here's the baseline uh, seizure frequency, then, um, then the device gets implanted and uh, usually they wait for about a month uh, before the device is switched on. And then in the blinded phase, half of the patients were switched on and half of the patients will be, were left on off. And what you see here is a really interesting phenomenon that if you just place the stimulator and you don't do anything, you don't switch it on, you don't switch it off, you see a 20% seizure reduction. And um, 
And then after that, you see a difference in seizure frequency reduction with the stimulator on or off, which is clearly significant. And that's what is the therapeutic effect. And this is what the therapeutic effect is in the statistical model that uh, overall there was a 17% seizure reduction in over the three months of treatment and in the last months of 29%. So this was a randomized controlled trial, um, which is different from long-term follow-up studies, which is what you see here. So these are, of course, studies that are not randomized and not controlled anymore. It's basically anybody who wants to keep it on, keeps it on, and also um, you can have medication changes during this time and what you see here that over years of treatment with the dbs it seems like the seizure reduction becomes significantly greater um, which may just this is a phenomenon we see a lot of neurostimulation devices. So in after five years, it goes up over 60%. Of course, a seizure reduction is never is desirable, but of course we want to have the patient seizure free. And um, about 18% with this device are seizure free for at least six months, 8% for at least two years. So it's by far not as effective as surgery, but it is also probably more effective than medications alone. What do we know about side effects? Um, actually, um, they're kind of that patients want to have it explanted, which is about 16%. You have some paresthesias, you have infection, um, and you have a small percentage of hemorrhages, but all consistent with any other deep brain stimulation device also used in Parkinson's and other diseases. So now from all what I told you, what is the right answer to our previous question? We don't know whether stimulation of the anterior nucleus is more effective than the central median nucleus. People have tried it in the central median nucleus, but only in smaller studies in a non-randomized controlled fashion. It's just we have more evidence for the um, anterior nucleus um, than, than we have for the central median nucleus. Um, there is this perception that the central median nucleus is more indicated for generalized epilepsy, but there has been actually no real study that, uh, that uh, shows, or no real larger study that shows this. But, um, and also it's actually not approved for this use in generalized epilepsy. So even though people do it off label, it is not an approved use. Um, then, as I told you, the seizure frequency uh, reduction is a little higher than 40% after five years. But what we see is really this 20% seizure reduction after implantation, which is that implantation effect. So um, also, I, we already talked about the central median nucleus. Um, these are other locations, not FDA approved, but nevertheless tried in clinical practice practice also other strike the hippocampus or the site of seizure onset um, also there are attempts to do two sites instead of um, just one site and this is just a study uh, some studies that are out there for studying uh, the DPS in the hippocampus as a small study with seven patients where it was effective and then there is also a larger study um, where uh, the sub-threshold sub stimulation uh, was attempted at Mayo. Now we come to VNS. So um, now I, we want to know what statement about the VNS is false, and I'm going to relaunch the polling. Okay, so these are the four questions. Um, 
so the question is what is false? Uh, VNS can deliver extra stimuli if the heart rate goes up, indicating a seizure. VNS therapy prevents patients from singing in a core as they become hoarse intermittently. In a mixed population, in data derived from observational study, median seizure reduction ranges from 50 to 60 percent. Um, and in randomized controlled trials, the seizure free rate is around 1%. So you already learned a little bit about the difference between randomized controlled trials and what observational studies show. They're often very different. Okay. We have 30 answers. Maybe we can make it up to 40. Thirty-nine. One more. Make your vote. Okay. So now we're up to forty. Forty-one. So there we have actually parody uh, to the question: What is false? That they pre it, that the VNS prevents them from singing, or the randomized seizure con uh, control tries seizure-free rate. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you all the evidence. And then we're going to come back to the question, what is a false answer? So this is the VNS. It has, there are several models that are out there um, that have been updated. It does not go into the brain. Logically, it goes to the vagal nerve in the neck. Um, these are the typical settings, 30 seconds on, five minutes off. So it's also intermittent stimulation. The amplitude can vary. This is a typical setting, but you can go up to three milliamps, so high you can go up. You can stimulate it two to 30 hertz, and the pulse width is 250 microseconds. You can also do rapid cycling, where you have um, a few seconds on and less of a time off if it doesn't work at your initial settings. The battery life is quite long, and now actually up to 10 years. And you can actually use a magnet for an extra stimulus at a usually at a higher current than your regular stimulus. So if the patient has a seizure, they can swipe the magnet, which gives them a little bit of a control and sometimes may shorten or influence the seizures. And also some devices or the newer devices have an automatic heart rate detection and deliver an extra stimulus if your heart rate goes up. Um, so what, what is the real double blind evidence for, um, for the VNS? This was all done in the nineties. This is, these are all old studies. So usually not as well known. And here we are just comparing them, uh, to typical drug studies in terms of seizure freedom. And actually the seizure freedom rate is quite low in those initial randomized control trials. If we go for seizure reduction, the, in, in drug trials, about 30 to 40 percent. In those initial trials, they it range around 25 to 27 percent for VNS. If we again, so this is the randomized controlled evidence, but if you really go for observational studies, again, if you look back, this is just the drug as compared to the VNS. Um, if you go for four years, for one year, for um, more than one year or a very mixed population, it ranges between 50 to 65%. What is a dollar, of, and this is the responder rate, is like a, a seizure reduction more than 50%. So what are the side effects um, for, um, for the VNS, um, some patients want to have it removed. The other side effects like bleed fracture infections, hoarseness and dysphagia is not too, is a significant side effect that can occur in most patients. It goes away with time, but in some it is persistent. Um, is there a specific population in which VNS works really good? If you take all medical refractory patients, you see those numbers over long-term observational studies. So 7% seizure-free, 
50% seizure reduction or 55. Of course, if you have Lennox Castell, you have less of a seizure reduction, but these are usually very severe epilepsy, so anything obviously helps. The same range in epileptic encephalopathies. It's also effective in generalized epilepsies. Children seem to respond somewhat better for whatever reason. And if you already had surgery, you're in the same range as like in medical refractory epilepsy. So what was the false answer? So this was a little bit of a trick question. Certainly the VNS can deliver an extra stimulus when the heart rate goes up. Um, so in some patients, and this is kind of a little trick to tell, is if they have hoarseness as a side effect, of course, singing in a core, is then it's a problem if they get intermittently hoarse while they're singing. Um, and however, what we, you can actually do, the patient can take the magnet and tape it over the VNS, which actually shuts it off for that time and then take it off again um, when, when they're done singing. So it, it shouldn't prevent patients from doing things like that. It's just a little trick. Um, and this other, the, I went over this, that there's a 50 to 60% um, uh, median seizure reduction and, um, and the seizure-free rate. So, uh, let me get to the next point, but before I go there, um, there are two questions, which I think are very good questions. So the first question was about intracranial mapping to confirm language or memory. So um, this is a very good point. Um, we weren't so worried about her language, but mainly about her memory. And as there are many fellows um, on this call, on this webinar, I would just like to know from fellows who, uh, whether you do memory mapping in your institution with intracranial electrodes and what kind of test you're using. So if you just want to use the chat and say, we are doing this for memory and testing it in a word memory task or something like that. We only do motor mapping. We don't do with intracranial, okay? Anybody doing? It's a really interesting thing to do, and we have tried it here, but we haven't standardized it. Ah, okay. In Michigan, they, what is the task they are doing? Oh, okay. So that's interesting. It's certainly something to consider, but memory mapping is a little more tricky than doing motive mapping or language mapping. Um, we do not do memory. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, but and we did not do it in this in our patient, but it's certainly something that can be done. Um, Okay, then the next question, would the efficacy of VNS predict response to DM, DBS? And if the patient has a VNS, is it worse to switch to DBS if still refractory? So we don't really know whether a VNS predicts a response to a DBS. Um, Often patients have already failed one therapy and then we, we switch to the other. Um, and this is just out of a attempt to make the patient better. So there's no real good study where it has been shown if you failed VNS, you're also gonna fail the DBS, but it's certainly something you all can consider doing and studying in your future career. So, um, 
Okay. Now we come to the RNS, our last device. I'll just have to be a little mindful of the time. Um, here again is the question. Uh, no, the question, where's my question? Oh, maybe it comes later. So the RNS is responsive stimulation. So this is what it looks like implanted into the skull. Here's a typical setup where there are electrodes in the bilateral hippocampus. It records electrocorticography. And this can be interrogated by the patient with a wand. And it detects epilepsy form activity and it stimulates then on demand. And these are the stimulation parameters. So it's a very brief stimulus. It's only 100 or 150 milliseconds long at 100 to 200 hertz. And the battery life is about four to eight years, and it is or has to be placed in the seizure focus. So you need to know about the seizure focus. So here is the question about RNS. And here again, the question is, what is true? RNS is not indicated in neocortical epilepsy. The overall current delivered to the brain is minimal as stimulation is often not longer than five to 10 minutes per day. The RNS cannot be used in multifocal epilepsy. The RNS can be charged wirelessly and remotely. Swiping the magnet provides an extra stimulus if the patient has a seizure and 30 to 40% are seizure free after five years. Okay, I'm going to end the polling. And the winner here is 30 to 40% are seizure free after five years. Um, we're going to come to the answer later. Um, so, this is how we thought responsive stimulation initially would work that you would have a seizure come on, then you would stimulate and it basically would abort the seizure. These are very brief pulses delivered after an individualized seizure detection multiple times per day. Here you see it in larger. After five times of stimulation, basically the device gives up and the stimulation is in the seizure onset zone and the overall current delivered is fairly low as there are only very, very short pulses and the stimu mean stimulation time per day is not more than five to six minutes. And, but it's not always like really aborting seizures. What it does, it really treats seizure surrogates or what we call long episode and it does so many hundred times per day. And um, it's never clear whether those would become a seizure if we wouldn't treat or not. And you can actually implant the device multiple ways. So um, a very common implant is these bilateral temporal lobe depths and bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy. But you also can do neocortical implants like here with frontal parietal cortical strips or some neocortical strips somewhere else. Or you can also have combinations where you have a depth electrode, like here in a periventricular heterotopia. Um, I think there are two depth electrodes in the heterotopia and the right hippocampus. So you can have all sorts of uh, combination of depths and strips depending on your seizure onset zone. And like these heterotopias usually are very hard to address surgically. So here's a randomized controlled data in 191 patients. Um, and again, after the device was implanted, you see there's again this implantation effect. So no matter what you implant into the brain, the seizure frequency goes down by 20%. 
And there is also the stimulators in both groups are off at this point. And they get actually switched on here. And here is a group where the stimulator is on. And here is a group where the stimulator is off. And you see it goes back to baseline about in about five months. So we think the implantation effect is only probably a few months long. And then here, the sham groups were switched on and you see a clear reduction in their seizure frequency. And this is again a therapeutic effect. Um, the last month seizure reduction was about 41, what was 41%. And then of course, there's also long-term observational data. Um, and there we divided it up for neocortical epilepsy and medial temporal lobe epilepsy, and it ranges from 60 to 74, 70%, and actually 17%, 15 to 17% are seizure-free um, for more than a year. And of course, patients where we know that are MRI positive and we are more sure of the seizure onset zone, they generally do better. And also, again, the question, is there a particular population that benefits more from this than others? There's no difference between, um, between uh, the mesial temporal and the other locations, there's no difference whether previous epilepsy surgery was performed or not, whether there are one or two seizure foci, because you can place it in two seizure fo so uh, foci, and also it doesn't matter whether they had a VNS or an intracranial EEG before, just in terms of safety, the same things you're seeing, you see implant side effections, you see um, device lead damage, um, and other events again, and intracranial hemorrhages, one of those actually happened to occur in one of our patients, and then general and the death were one was suicide, two possible, and one probable, and two definite suicide. Um, but the SUDET rate with the RNS is actually lower than the general accepted rate in, um, in those patients. And there's not always a seizure proceeding because if we can get the recording, we try to get it. So um, from the device while, the, while it happened. Um, so, um, so coming back to our question, which statement about the RNS is true? And the right answer was that the overall current is low because it's only a few minutes per day. And this is a little bit of an underestimate after five years, the 30 to 40%. And there's no wireless option yet, but maybe in the future. And we can certainly use it in multifocal epilepsy and we should use it in neocortical epilepsy. And the magnet, this is also an important point, the magnet of the RNS does only save an ECOG on the device. It does not provide an extra stimulus. So um, then I want to go briefly over a few things we learned from the RNS that, um, that because we have this chronic ECOG recordings, um, and this is also a poll. This is, I think, my last poll. Yeah. So the question is, what did we learn of the RNS in clinical practice? Um, temporal lobe epilepsy is more often by temporal than we think. Seizure diary are used in medication trials are a reliable indicator of seizure activity. And seizures are completely randomly distributed and do not follow any patterns. And I think, Christina, some people have issues with the mic. Maybe you want to look. Oh, no, it's not. Okay. Okay. Now it's fine. Okay. It's fine. Okay, so we'll end the polling. And the winner is temporal lobe epilepsy is more often bitemporal than we think, and that is actually the right answer. Um, 
and this comes to the lessons we have learned that um, in bitemporal lobe epilepsy, this is a very nice study where the average time to actually record a bilateral seizure was about 41 days in these 82 patients. Um, so it may take longer than the 10 days patients are in the epilepsy monitoring unit. And actually 16% of patients who we thought they have bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy had actually only unilateral seizures. And then another point and another big uh, quick uh, case presentation is this patient. Uh, I'm not sure what the last question, when you say bitemporal, are you saying 100%? I'm not quite understanding the question. So Eric, if you want to clarify, that would be great. Um, it, so it just is to hear that you were talking about there were a by study they do where they both following RNS statements where it's like they were saying it had hundred side versus the other. Uh, yeah. It, um, Hmm. I, I had a hard time understanding when you were breaking up. Can you write? And we'll, I will address it after this slide. I just want you to meet Kevin, who is actually 26-year-old <laughs> um, um, with mesial temporal sclerosis. In the same case like we had before, like had significant memory problems. Um, and on on the site that was to be resected. And we put an RNS in, in bitemporal lobe, and he comes in every time and says he's seizure-free with his RNS. And now we have all these recordings, and we see this events that are happening intermittently over six months. And the question is now what is true and what is not, what is the truth? are those seizures and the patient is just not knowing them or he doesn't remember them or are these subclinical events and then um, the patient is truly not having any seizures and of course this has very significant implications like do we let this patient drive or not because before RNS if he comes in and says he's seizure free we would have just let him drive and now we have all these information is basically the questions, what do we do with that? So this is the next lesson, what we learned from the RNS, that seizure diaries and what we record is not necessarily concordant. And it's not entirely clear how they correlate with clinical seizures. And also it's not really clear, what is a seizure? It seems to be kind of a continuum. When does a seizure really become clinically relevant? And we can probably not decide this on electrographic activity. And then how do we deal with legal consequences such as driving? Another thing we learned from the RNS that there are rhythms of interictal activity um, that like in female patients, there are certainly rhythms of uh, this epileptic form activity with their cycle, but also you see cycles in men, uh, which is also interesting, which follow kind of a monthly pattern. And there are also daily patterns, circadian pattern, as well as patterns that are more than several days long. And if you take the circadian and multi day rhythms and you basically line, line them up with each other, you can actually make predictions when the patient has the most interictal activity or the most seizures. So seizures are certainly not completely random. They follow these patient-specific rhythms. Also, you can use the RNS to monitor, uh, to monitor medication changes, like you see here, where you do a change in medication, you see a clear change in the epileptic form activity. And this, this is another little fun fact or a little fun study where somebody looked at the impact of caffeine, caffeine on interictal activity. 
And actually, if the patient was abstinent from caffeine, then the patient had to decreased epileptiform activity and caffeine actually increased it. It's still unclear what's the relationship of caffeine and seizures, but it's an interesting fun fact. So that was the right answer. Temporal lobe epilepsy is more often bitemporal than we think. Um, and maybe this was a question whether we think this is in 100% that temporal lobe epilepsy is bitemporal, but that I doubt that. Uh, but we don't know the right percentage. So, and this is what happened with our patients. I, with our patients, I'm going to tell you in the end. Um, yes, and also, um, of course, the question comes up whether if you have these three devices, can you combine approaches? And there was actually a good study, a very recent study by Larry Hirsch, where an RNS was placed first to monitor for bitemporal activity. And then in 24 patients, actually, um, then a resection was performed after the RNS uh, was placed and didn't make the patient seizure free. So this is certainly also an option that can be looked at. Also an option is combining devices. You can have an RNS and a VNS, for example, but there's not a lot of good data out there yet. It's usually in the case report stage. Um, and what did we do with our patients? Actually, at that time, DBS wasn't approved yet. So we put in an RNS and we actually put it in um, a bitemporally. And we put it in for the reason because the left temporal region had a lot of indirect activity and we weren't sure it is not bilateral because the left hippocampus was very poorly functional. So it was certainly not a healthy hippocampus. Uh, but her seizures are only consistently coming out of the right. This actually is her, what would we call the long uh, episode count over the years, it was placed quite some time ago. And you see that clearly with time, the long episodes go down. And she had a significant reduction in her seizure frequency. She may have one minor one every few months. And what we were also able to do was really to reduce her medications. You may remember she was quite a taxing on all these medications she was on. She is now only in gabapentin and carbamazepine. So I took her off the phenytoin um, because she was so ataxic. I was not able to reduce the haloperidol further because then she was starting to hear voices again. And I also put her on citalopram, which actually for some depressing symptom, which helps quite a bit. And now she's actually only calling her brother. Her ataxia is significantly improved. And she only calls her brother now once per week, which she actually very much appreciates. And she is still living independently after these many years. And with that, thank you to my team and thank you for joining. And I am open for any other questions, either in and if you want to really ask a question over Zoom or over the chat, I'm happy to answer those. How important is the accuracy of RNS implantation? So there's no real study who um, demonstrates that because we never know how accurate it is. But I think, so just out of clinical experience, it seems important that you're as close to the seizure onset zone as you can be. Um, okay. Does VNS predict the response to, oh, we had that already, that to DPS? Um, I think it's definitely worthwhile if you, the VNS failed to try a DBS. So I have had patients where we did that. Also, we had quite a few patients where we switched from a VNS to the RNS. 
um, and then the RNS um, was quite successful. So it's always worthwhile trying another modality. Okay, any other questions? I think otherwise we're actually at time. If uh, one more question. If imaging scalp VEG and invasive EG show a unilateral mesial tendon, so this is a really good question. Um, whether you should always place it bilaterally or whether you should place it unilaterally, um, it really depends on the patient. In the patients we have placed it bilaterally. We usually had some indication like from the water test or from the neuropsych testing that the right-sided hippocampus is also diseased or that on intracranial EEG, there's a lot of interictal activity also on the other side. Um, so I can't say that generally you should always do bilateral um, EEG implants, but if you have doubts about that, um, then you may consider it. So you always have to think about what is the bigger possibility of this being hippocampal, or do you rather want to maybe put in a depth electrode and a lateral strip electrode over the temporal cortex if you're not entirely sure whether it's mesial. So I think these decisions are really dependent on your intracranial EEG and what you see there. All right, okay. Even though I don't, can't meet you all personally, I hope you're all doing well in your fellowship and things are going okay in these kind of unusual times. Um, episode, epilepsy is a lot of fun and I hope you stay with the field. And also you can email me or whatever if you have any other questions and we'll, would love to see you at the American Epilepsy Society meeting in December in one or another form. Thank you very much.